If you are joining us at home, many of our friends in the community do. We're so grateful that you're here, but we want you to know a little bit later in the service, we are going to participate in communion or the Lord's Supper. So if you're at home, feel free to grab juice or whatever bread you have at the house or your town home or dorm room. We want to help you participate with us. If you're here this morning in this room, listen, you can always connect with us a couple of ways. You can always come down front after the service. We'd love to meet you. You can always go by the welcome desk in the commons area before you leave. Let us know how we can serve you. That would be our privilege. I'm so grateful to Rachel Seiler and the worship team. They're going to lead us this morning. I believe God's got something that he wants to say through scripture, through the lyrics of the songs, every element of the service, and I'm thrilled that you're here for it. Let me invite you to go ahead and stand as the worship team leads us this morning. Would you worship with us?
this next song is a newer one, so um, I just encourage you to sing, and just it's easy to pick up as we go through it. So um, it's, a, it's a special song, and I think that today we need to be reminded more than ever that God is the same as yesterday. He is the same today, and he will be the same tomorrow. He's the one constant in our life that we can trust, that we can hold on to, and we know is not going to throw us a curveball or change because he is faithful. He's faithful to the promises and the covenant he's given us. Um, So if y'all would sing this song with me.
Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Mm. Gosh, I don't know who needs to hear that. But I believe we worship through giving. We worship through singing. We worship through the preaching of the word. Like, I pray that you would worship. Like, we're talking about the lyrics that Rachel chose for that song. We're talking about a new identity, a new hope, a new future, promise, joy, excitement. So if God woke you up, got you dressed for the sole purpose of hearing that and believing that that lyric is drenched in Scripture, then that's for you. And I pray that you would live as if you believe that. What we want to do over the next couple of minutes is we want to worship through praying together. And one of the things I hope you know is that because of Christ's finished work for you on the cross, the risen Jesus makes it possible for you to pray directly to God. So you should pray the other six days of the week if you're a follower of Jesus. I hope you know that. You have that access. You have that permission. As a child of God, I am a child of God. If you're in Christ, you're a child of God. You have access to the Father, and you ought to take advantage of that. But there is something powerful when we pray together. And early in the book of Acts, we see that when the church gathered, they prayed together. The Lord unified their hearts when they prayed over specific things. So we want to do that. So over the next few minutes, you you may want to pray for any request you have of the Lord. You may want to pray for a specific need, work-related, relationship-related, something coming up in the next couple of days. Um, We want you to pray as you feel led. I'm also going to tell you how we're going to pray very specifically over a couple of folks that are here in our church. Where's Kiefer? Kiefer, are you in here? Kiefer Johnson? Is Kiefer in here? Kiefer, come up here. And uh, Mackenzie, bring your fiance, Mackenzie Lowry, here with you. Um, Kiefer Johnson has been an intern here at the church for more than the last year. Uh, And so some of you may recognize Kiefer. He's been an intern Uh, with young professionals in our groups and disciple-making ministry. And one of the privileges that I have had, and he has been working under the direct supervision of Hunter Melton, Hunter and I have both seen like God working and shaping a calling in Kiefer's life to full-time vocational ministry. And that is so exciting to, to like, we say this anecdotally, to have a front row seat to watch when this happens. So we've been for that and wanting him to dust for God's fingerprints in his life And he felt led recently to apply for our two-year ministry residency program where he will full-time be involved in the local church. He'll be assigned to one of our regional campuses. He will be given more power and more more empowerment and more authority to lead and make decisions and step out in faith in a way where he can be shaped and coached and encouraged even more than he is now. So that is what he's about to do. And so we're going to pray over him because on July 1, he starts that. And we are going to send him to the church at Lachlan Springs, our sister campus, about four miles away in East Nashville. So we're thrilled about that. It's the best of of everything, and it's the worst of everything, because we love this brother. And we don't want to miss him being here, but we're thrilled about what God's doing. The reason I asked Mackenzie to be here is they are engaged to be married. Later this year, they will be married. And I shared in the first service... Um, that Mackenzie, I'll say it again, like you are a leader, Uh, whether this guy was standing here with you or not, like you are a leader, you have put your thumbprints on our young professional ministry, you've you've led a life group. I can remember during the pandemic, like you went through like life group leader training on Zoom and other things like that. I mean, um, I've always been impressed with your commitment to the local church. And we believe that God has brought you together for such a time as this and that you are better together than you are as individuals from this fall forward. And so that's what we're going to be praying for. So, Kiefer, I just want to thank you. On behalf of a grateful pastor, grateful church, thanks for loving Jesus, but ministering to this body. I'm grateful for that. Mackenzie, thanks for your service. We want God's best for y'all. What, what a treat for us to pray. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Kiefer, Mackenzie, you guys stand right here. Um, if you're a leader in our church, you know them, you don't know them, but you want to pray over them, I want to invite you to come forward. So you can go ahead and start moving now. You're going to see some folks coming forward to pray over them. There's something uh, in the book of Acts very powerful when you feel the, the presence of God through his people, that God is for you. And so that's, that's what we're doing right now. So let me encourage you just over the next you know, 90, 120 seconds where you're seated, you pray for whatever you need to. Also, keep them in your heart and your mind for the days and the weeks ahead. And then in just a moment, I'll close our time of prayer together. Let's pray.
we are here in this building, Lord Jesus. But for some of us, mentally and emotionally and even spiritually, it's just taken us a while to get here. Uh, it is a beautiful, but it is a challenging world. And so for my brother or my sister, the woman, the man, the teenager, or the child, who uh, it was all, all they could do to get dressed this morning, let them be mindful that you see them and you love them. If that's all they need to be reminded of today, in Christ they are seen and fully loved. Let them believe that. For the big decisions that are represented in this room, work, career, difficult conversations that have to happen this week, whatever's represented in this room, by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, the Bible tells us in Christ we have your mind available to us. We have wisdom beyond what we can do on our own. Bless my brothers and sisters. Give us what we need to live and think and act in a way that honors you and your Father and helps us flourish as you intended. And for our brother Kiefer, what a joy and a privilege to have a front row seat to the way that you've shaped his life. And as he's leaned in to the calling you've put on his life and he aspires to serve in the local church, Jesus, you died for the local church. You love the people that you have ransomed unto yourself so that they might flourish. Bless this brother to steward this influence well. He's awesome at so many things. Let him continue to find joy in relationships and ministry. We are so grateful to have witnessed you bringing together Kiefer and McKenzie. We pray that they together, as they have been, would have greater influence with the gospel in the months and years ahead as a couple. Protect their relationship. Put a hedge of protection around their marriage. I pray that there would be other men in this congregation and in the church at Lachlan Springs and that there would be other men in your kingdom who would want to and feel compelled by your spirit to go into ministry because of this brother right here. So we are sowing seeds for your glory and for gospel advancement into the future today. And we ask that you would harvest those for your glory and for our brother and our sister's joy in ministry. We love you. Can't believe we get together every Sunday and do this together. Let the fellowship be sweet. Let our hearts be open real wide to hear and see what you would have for us the remainder of our time together. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Did I turn the alarm on? Where should we go for vacation? Did I feed the dog today? Is my phone charging? What came first? Definitely. When are they the making chicken? another bug? I forgot to get to gas. Will I have time in the morning? What am I doing with my life? How do I find joy again? Am I really loved? Do I still love them? Am I forgiven? How do I know I'm saved? Well, church family, we're going to continue worshiping by reading God's word together. And so if you have a copy of the scriptures, I want to invite you to join me in 1 John. To join me in 1 John, and if you do not, you are always welcome to take a copy that's on that back resource table or to follow along on your phone. We want you to read so that the other six days of the week when we're scattered into the places where we live, where we work, and where we play, the Holy Spirit can encourage you, strengthen you, and build you up because you can go back to this word for yourself. And so 1 John chapter 2, and while you're turning there, let me share with you that um, recently, I, I just had a wonderfully surprising and pleasant experience of someone being an advocate on my behalf, on our behalf. I shared with you recently that our son had surgery, and it is not unusual, as you might imagine, uh, what a privilege and an honor for a pastor or ministerial staff to be in hospitals. So it's not unusual to be in a hospital setting, and I, I feel comfortable in that environment, but I, I often am praying with or over others. I very rarely at a hospital have someone pray over me. And right before uh, our son's surgery, the physician said, 
Do y'all mind if we pray? I was like, excuse me? Like, absolutely, go for it. Like, twist my arm. We would love that. So he said, let's, let's hold hands. It got real, real quick in pre-op, okay? And, and we held hands, and, and he began to pray. And he began to pray, Lord, you've, you've blessed me with the ability to, to provide physical healing, and I ask that you would do that now in the next few moments. And we pray for this patient. And he prayed over our son, and we pray for these parents. And I was just so surprised. I was crying. I just started crying. I'm a major weeper, and I was just like crying. And um, I, I was just so grateful. I think what caught me off guard is, uh, you, you know, when you, when you want, when somebody wants something that's for the best for your child, that, that really resonates in your heart. But when he prayed and wanted something for me and something for us, like he, he was, it was advocacy. I want something for you. And uh, it was just such a blessing that, like, listen, when we, uh, after the surgery was over and he met with us at a little conference table to tell how it went and gave us, the, you know, the directions for when we leave, I stood up and I, I just hugged that brother. And I just hugged him. I don't know if that's appropriate or not. He probably had to scrub in again, but I was like, just bring it in, big guy. Um, because when someone in a position of power or authority is an advocate for you, First of all, like it, it, it makes you want to draw near to them. You, you feel a bond with them Be, because you realize you're in a position where you might actually flourish. You might actually do well in a way that they want it for you, and they can help you perhaps pursue that. The reason I tell you that is you're about to see in Scripture that Jesus Christ is the best advocate you could ever have. And for some of us who wondered, should I get dressed? The kids are screaming. Why is it Sunday morning when spiritual warfare erupts around the, the breakfast table? Should I come in? Should I get dressed? I got a busy afternoon. Got a busy work day tomorrow morning. Should I be here? I'm so glad you are. Because I believe God wants you to know that he is for you. And the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross is everything that you will ever need to flourish and reach your full potential that God's ever wanted for you. Now that is good news, and you needed to hear that today. But stand in honor of God's word with me, because I don't want you to take my word for it. Let's read 1 John chapter 2, verses, verses 1 through 2 together. John says, My little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the whole world. Now, this is just two verses, so let's read it together again. My little children, I've, I've written you this letter so that you would not sin. But if you do sin, you need to know that you have an advocate for you. Someone with power and authority who goes before the Father for you. His name is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, but not only ours, for the sins of the world. Keep your Bible open. And keep it with you in your heart and your mind as we walk through the next few moments together. But let's just pray that the Spirit would teach us, guide us, and go ahead of us to prepare our hearts for what's next. God, thank you for your faithfulness to us. We are undeserving. We've never done anything that would cause you to love us because even our best efforts are few and far between. And they feel like worthless rags against your holiness and your righteousness and your unblemished character. So my goodness, how could we leave church, this gathering of worship, and not say how wonderful you are to us? Jesus, thank you for going ahead of us and thank you for being our advocate. I pray that the woman, the man, the teenager, or the child who needs to know that you're for them would hear it, receive it, and live as if it's true this week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Well, we've only read two verses together. I shared with you to keep your Bible open. I'm going to go back into chapter 1 for just a moment here. But we've read two verses from 1 John chapter 2. And John tells us why he wrote the whole letter. 
multiple chapters, a pretty lengthy letter to Christians in Ephesus, the Ephesians, to the Absouthers, if you will. Here's why I wrote this letter. I wrote this letter so that you might not sin. That you might not sin. Now, sin is anything that separates us from a holy and a righteous God. And literally, the Greek word for sin is missing the mark. It's as if you shot an arrow at a target and you were way off target. Sin is anything that misses the target of God's holiness, of his righteous character. And John said, I've written this whole letter. There are other things we've seen. His encouragement that if we've been loved by God, we should love and serve others. That There are many things he's written in here that we can learn from, that we can put into practice. But he said, I've written these things so that you might not sin because sin separates us from God. And what John wants for us is to be in fellowship with God, to know God and to enjoy him forever. That's the chief end of man or woman is to know God and to enjoy him forever. And so one of the best ways that he described this, look with me in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. Let's read verses 5 through 10 together. This is the message that we've heard from him, that's Jesus, and now declare to you, church, that God is light and there's absolutely no darkness in God. If we say we have fellowship with him, there's that word again, fellowship with God. If we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we're lying. We're lying. And the first person you lie to is yourself. We're lying that we are practicing the truth. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as Jesus is in the light, then we also have fellowship not only with him, but with each other by the blood of Jesus, his son, that cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, then we're deceiving ourselves and the truth's not in us. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and righteous. Or your translation may say he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all righteousness as if we had never sinned. Because if we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Now, one of the things I want you to know is that John loves you. John loves you and he cares for you and he wants God's best for you. And that's why he would talk to you about the danger of sin separating you from God. All of us were cute and cuddly perhaps at the moment of our birth, but we were born sinners separated from God. He is holy. We are not. Original sin has been passed down through generations. It courses through our veins. Spiritually speaking, we are born with a sin nature. We're separated from God at birth. Now, when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, it could be after a service, it could be during a sermon, it could be while you're singing and God opens up your heart and you say, what we sung, I want to be a child of God, I want to be in Christ, I want to give my life to Christ. What happens then is God removes your sin through Jesus' finished work on the cross and you're reconciled to him. You are in right fellowship with him. Or again, remember, what God's always wanted is a people that he could create and be in relationship with so that you could be fully known and fully loved. And that you could fully know God and soak up and drink in all of the wonderment and all of the beauty and the amazement of that. That's what happens at salvation. So there could be somebody in the room, there could be watching online that, that is not a child of God, that is not in relationship with God through faith. You are still at odds, an enemy of the cross, so to speak. That may sound harsh, it may sound pretty blunt. Maybe you're not like, I'm against God, but it's literally what it means. If you're not in fellowship, then you are separated from him. Now, for those of us who are in Christ, we know we're not perfect. We know we're going to sin. We know we're going to make mistakes. And so John's talking about that. Like, if you do sin, you're going to sin. Don't act like you're not susceptible to sin. Now, i got to be honest with you. A lot of times when somebody's preaching about sin and talking about sin, I don't really respond well when somebody's like, you're born a sinner. You need Jesus. Repent of your sin. You're going to sin in the future. Like, wow, coming in hot. You ever heard a sermon like that? You heard a pastor like that? Like, I don't, it's, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying, like, I don't you know, normally respond well to that. But if somebody loves me and they want God's best for me and I am in sin, wouldn't you want them to tell me, like, hey, this ain't good. This is, this is keeping you from flourishing. This is keeping you from healthy fellowship with God. That's why, listen, we don't naturally as humans put ourselves in a position where sometimes we might hear things that are unpleasant, but actually will help us grow. 
Conversely, a lot of people in life surround themselves with people that tell them only what they want to hear, right? Did did you notice what John did? My little children. Did you see what he said in verse 1 of chapter 2? My little children. The proper translation is my little born again ones. My little born again ones. That's literally what it means. He's talking to the church. He's talking to Christians. He ain't preaching to the world. He's talking to the church. And he said, you're going to sin. You're going to make mistakes. This is a beautiful but a broken world. And and, and the challenge is you are in Christ, but your flesh will still want to pursue things that are apart from God. That's why we talk about reading the word and being in biblical community and serving together as a church. Put yourself in a position to be reminded of the things of God and to run from your temptation and to flee sinful thoughts or attitudes or behaviors. And that's why we talk about biblical community. Borrow that phrase, my little children. It most likely means John was an old man. John was an old man. Anybody he's talking to is younger than him, most likely. But you think about somebody in their 80s talking to a millennial or talking to Generation Z or somebody like that. We're talking 50 years. We're talking 60 years. Like he, He's saying, my little children. It, it's probably his age, but it also means like he loved these people. It's also speaking of the affection and the tenderness he has. So isn't that an interesting clue that John's like, sin separates you from God. You're in Christ? Okay, here's the deal. Sin will keep separating you from God and keep you from flourishing in fellowship with him. And he's talking about it in the context of relationship. He ain't preaching at them. He's in fellowship with them. And I'm going to suggest to you that you're robbing yourself of the opportunity to flourish if you're not in biblical community with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Because what if preacher stands up and says, you are sinning, and maybe you feel conviction, and there's there's something going on in your life. You know it's true. Yep, that's true. I am. But but it's it's hard. Your flesh doesn't want to respond, and it's easy to to get harder in your heart and walk out of here and say, I ain't going to do anything with that. How dare he? How dare he get up in my business? But, But what if you're in community? Every Tuesday night, you meet with your life group. You pray together, and you carry one another burden. Think about all the one another's. You pray for one another. You grieve with one another. You cry with one another. You rejoice with one another. And what if somebody had the audacity to say, hey, there's something going on in your life, and and let's talk about it? Or what if you, let's just pick this. What if the Holy Spirit makes you aware of something? Let's just pick something. What if you are a supervisor or an employer, and the Holy Spirit makes you aware that you know what you're doing? You are using people to get where you want to go in your company and to build your brand and to be successful. And you really don't care about the people that God's asked you to steward. What? What? That's just random. If anybody in the room's like, is he talking to me? How does he know my story? That's when you and the Holy Spirit, okay? That would be a random coincidence. But, but, but what, if, what if you had nowhere to flesh that out? Is that of the Lord? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's of the Lord. What if you shared that in a group of people that want God's best for you, and they didn't sit there ready to judge you or hammer you, oh my gosh, you're an evil person. But what if they said, well, what do you want to do about that? What do you think the Lord is leading you to do about that? Did you see what it said in verse 9? If we will confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. What if somebody in relationship with you said, let's drag that thing out into the light. Since he's of the light, let's drag that thing out into the light. Let's confess that thing. Let's drag it out into the light. So maybe you're like, I ain't doing that in front of 12 people in the living room. You are out of your mind. That's fine. Maybe you have a mentor in the church. Mentor relationship ministry in our church is flourishing where people meet one-on-one and they talk about scripture and they talk about what God's doing. And, And many of the groups that get together say, if this is true, then what? If this is true, then what? If the Lord reveals that to you and you got a group that wants God's best for you and says, yeah, that, that's sinful. We need to deal with that. I can't forgive you for that. Jesus can, but let's go ahead and deal with that. Let's deal with it together. People who want God's best for you. It's in the context of relationship. And most of us are a, like, remember, John's saying all this about what sin does to us because he wants us to flourish. And, and most of us are afraid to go there to be vulnerable. And I get that, so I don't want to minimize that. But I think we're afraid that like I, I, that's going to be an awful thing for me. It's going to be awful. And yeah, there are consequences for sin. But but did you see what it says in verse 9? If you will confess and repent of sin that Jesus is faithful, and he is just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Like when you come forward to Jesus with that, and you realize he's for you, he's your advocate. Advocacy is somebody who's in a position of power and authority who wants to use that to help you. 
Jesus isn't waiting there to shame you and make you feel dirty and guilty. He, he's waiting to say, bring that to me so that I can remove that burden from you. I've already accomplished it on the cross. Let me apply that to your life now so that you might draw closer to God. Remember what I said earlier about advocacy? When somebody's really for you like that, you want, you want to hug them. like You want to be close to them. When you realize Jesus is for you, it makes confession and repentance, which is a daily habit we should all do. Ain't nobody perfect. That's how we keep the subtle sins. Like nobody wakes up and says, today I'll destroy my life. But you make one step this afternoon, and the next day you make a step, and you make 365 steps over the next year, and you wake up after a decade and a thousand steps later, you're like, I am nowhere near where I thought I'd be. This is not what God wants of me. So confession and repentance ought to be a part of our life every day. I, I still think we're afraid that if we confess, we're going to be hammered by the Lord, who's this judge waiting to just let us have it. That's why a story recently really caught my attention. Like, if we will confess, if we will just own it, like, we might actually want to draw closer to the Lord and see what he could do in our life. One, one of our other staff members at one of our regional campuses pointed out that they stumbled upon a story in the New York Times. There's a New York Times article written recently, and um, it shared the news that as of October of 2021, about six months ago, as of October 2021, all New York City public libraries canceled all of their outstanding late fees. For all time. Last October, New York City public libraries, which are nearly, I think, 180, almost 200 libraries in that massive city, said, we are canceling all of the late fees. Now, I did a little dive here, and I found out that in the early 1900s in New York City, it was one cent per day if your book was late. One cent per day. That ain't no big deal. 1950s, oh, it grew to two cents. Okay, it's still no big deal. But as of last October, the late fee charge was 25 cents a day for a book, a magazine, or a DVD that had been checked out. Younger generations, I'll explain to you later what DVDs are and how they put stuff on a laser disc and we played it in this thing underneath our TV. Okay, but that's for another time. At 25 cents a day, imagine the debt of somebody who checked out a book a year ago and hadn't returned it. They owe $91.25. I think gas is costly. I think food is costly. I know I need to pay that debt, but that could buy, like, I don't know, a quarter of a tank of gas for 91 bucks. I need that money. If you had not returned that book in a decade, 10 years, you owed 900. I'm not good at math, but I know this much. It's about 912 bucks. You'd owe nearly $1,000. Now, that may not feel like a lot, but do you remember what I said? If you and I are told, if you confess and if you repent, the Father is waiting like he's waiting to receive you because Jesus has already canceled your debt on the cross. And you may actually find great joy in drawing near to the Father, and you might be on the verge of flourishing. Remember when I told you that? From October 2021 to February of 2022, a nearly six-month span, approximately 90,000 books in New York City were returned to libraries. Nearly 100,000 books were returned to libraries. Listen, some of the books have been checked out so long, like they, they showed up at libraries that don't exist anymore. <laughs> and people like restaurants and you know, strip malls were like, I don't, I don't know what to do with this. One at a time, two at a time, boxes of books came rolling in, some with notes of apology, some with notes of gratitude. Somebody wrote this, the article says, quote on a post-it note, enclosed are the books I have borrowed and kept in my house for 28 to 50 years. Not like 28 or 30, that's like a 28 or 50, <laughs> half a century. <laughs> hey, look, maybe it's Pride and Prejudice, Mr. Darcy's a stud, who knows, whatever, right? I am now 75 years old. Whoever this is, it's a woman. She checked it out in her 20s. These books have helped me through motherhood and helped further my teaching career. Thank you. Wow, canceling her debt made her grateful. Wow. Here's another one. I want to apologize. I'm sorry for living with these books so long. They became family. 
while that compelled someone to apologize for what they had done because their debt was canceled. You see what John was getting at? You see what John was getting at? This is a modern day story illustrating, it's a fascinating study in human behavior when you know your debt's been canceled and you're not going to be punished because Jesus already bore it on the stripes on his back. You can always come home. And some people said, I just, I'm so grateful. Thank you. I found this fascinating in the article. The article said that many people, like, became friends with the librarians. I know I've had this for 50 years, and I owe $1.5 trillion in late fees. <laughs> but since it's gone, can we hang out? And over shared interests, there are stories in the rest of that article about people becoming bonded in relationship because the debt had been canceled. Some people said, I'm sorry I've lived with this so long. When you know, listen, hey, sin separates you from a God who is just to punish sin. God has every right to punish sin. But he's also so faithful to say, guess what, though? I'll also ask my son to pay for your sin instead of you. And so for some people, they came into the library and saying, I'm so sorry I've lived with this sin for so long. The cross is the most hopeful of things because when you realize you've been forgiven, you don't have to trudge on in like, God, I'm so sorry. Like, what if you're like, I'm so sorry I've been living with this sin for so long. And what if you were treated in a similar fashion? Verse 9, he is faithful and just to cleanse and forgive us of all sin. As if we'd never sinned before. What if you knew that's how you're going to be treated when you wanted to just repent and tell the Lord you're sorry? That's a healthy thing to do, right? And John said, I've written this so that you might know how to flourish in relationship with God. So I don't know when you read a text like this, when you hear a modern day example of behavior, what it means to know that we've been forgiven. I don't know if this morning if it makes you want to come out of hiding bring something to light. But I promise you, the Father's waiting there to embrace you. And, and by the way, get this. Jesus doesn't sleep, and he doesn't doze off. So when you went to bed last night, he's interceding for you. He's being an advocate to his Father. I want your best. I'm going to go around this room and name, I want your best for Mary. I want your best for Jennifer. I want your best for John. I want your best for Mary. Like, just go, all, I could name everybody in this room and every name that come to mind. I want your best for your children. And when you woke up this morning before that first cup of coffee that made you an instant human this morning, guess who was still there as your advocate pleading for the Father? Jesus uses his power and authority. He, he's motivated first to obey and glorify his Father. Let's get that straight. But you happen to be the beneficiary of his advocacy. <clears throat> He wants to use his power and his authority to help you flourish, to help you draw close to the Lord, to help you want to be close to the Father. And that's why John said, I've written this, so that the next time that comes up, own it, deal with it, draw close to God, keep flourishing. That's what he's writing here. My little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin... You have an advocate. You have a helper. You have somebody that's working on your behalf. And his name is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Righteous means he's the only one qualified. Listen, Jesus is the only one who has the right to stand in front of the God of the universe. Because he's holy and sinless. That's why in the book of Acts, when it says there's no other name given on planet earth, any country, any continent, any group of people, whereby they may be saved, but the name of Jesus Christ. Why do we want to make the name of Jesus known in here and around the globe? Because ain't nobody qualified with his perfection, his righteousness, to stand in front of the Father and plead your case. And he's doing it right now. Unreal. Praise God for Jesus Christ. Right? So here's the deal. I think it is so helpful every time we, we walk through a text together 
to do something with that text. Because if you don't, here's what's most likely going to happen. Everything you hear, or even if you're like, yes, that's true, John. Yes, that's true, Holy Spirit. You'll probably leave it right here in this room. So you need to drive a stake in the ground. You need to take a step of faith. You need to do something. <clears throat> so here's what I want you to know. I'm going I'm to ask the worship team and the band to kind of make their way back up to the platform. There'll be a little bit of movement in the room. Uh, I'm going to ask the deacons to make their way to the communion tables. So you'll hear them moving in the room. But if you need to confess sin and repent of it, that is, you, you quite possibly, that is the best of things. And you quite possibly are on the edge. You're on the threshold of some unbelievable moments of growth and flourishing with God in the days and years ahead that you have never tapped into before. And if you need to do that, then do that. If over the next couple of moments you just like, I can't believe how good Jesus is. Remember those people that return the books? They're like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Over the next couple of moments, if you just want to pray, thank you, Jesus. Those three words, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's nobody like you, Jesus. And give him your praise. Give him your praise. He's, he's worthy of it. So do what you need to do in the next few moments. But we're also going to do something together. We're going to come to these communion tables. Because the breaking of Jesus' body, which is symbolized in this bread, and the shedding of his perfect blood, which is symbolized in this cup, is symbolic of his advocacy on your behalf at the cross. And Jesus said, as often as you do this, you proclaim my death for you. So when I pray in just a moment, you can stay where you're seated and pray. You can begin to move to the tables. When you come to the tables, step out, if you will, of the row you're seated on towards the walls and come forward. The deacons will serve you the bread. They will serve you the cup. They may say a few words about those things, but you'll take those and make your way back to your seat. And when it looks like, I'll keep an eye on the room, when it looks like everyone has had a chance to be served, I'll come back up here and we will partake together. I pray that you would have the courage and the faith to do what you need to do over the next couple minutes, even if that is to invite Jesus Christ into your life and to profess your belief in him for salvation for the first time ever. I'm going to pray you'd have the courage to do that. These tables belong to followers of Jesus. If you need to profess your faith in him today and then confidently and joyfully make your way to the table to profess what he's done for you on the cross, then you do that. Lord Jesus, this room belongs to you. Every heart and every mind is available to you now. Have your way in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You come to the tables when you're ready.
before I leave, uh, lead us in taking the bread and drinking the cup, make sure you tell Jesus what you need to tell him. That last 10%, that last little bit of your heart you hold on to, let me give you 30 seconds. Tell Jesus what you need to tell him. small piece of bread that you now hold in your hand is symbolic of the body of Christ his perfect body which was broken for you what that means is that he's able to give you wholeness you can tap into his flourishing now that's the word for shalom peace you're flourishing you can do that now but there's a day coming with Jesus in heaven where you will be fully whole no sickness no virus no disease no cancer No awkward conversations like no inadequacies, no struggles within yourself like that's what this body represents. That's hopeful. Take now and eat all of it. The cup of juice that you now hold in your hand is a deep, rich red color. It is symbolic of the blood of Christ which was shed for you on the cross. John said he is the sacrifice. He had to shed his blood to atone for our sin. Not only for the church, but for the sins of the world. Jesus made forgiveness of sin available, but it's not automatic. You, by faith in Jesus, have received the forgiveness of sin. We sung, I am a child of God earlier. I pray you would put those two things together and when you walk out of here in just a few moments, leave here with your head held high that in Christ you are enough. In Christ, because of his blood, you can begin again eternal life. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take now and drink all of it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's always been about you. It continues to be about you. And as long as you will allow us to be, it will always be about you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and sing this song of response about the goodness of our God.
invite you to have a seat for just a moment before we conclude our time together. You know if you're part of our church, if we worship through a number of ways when we're gathered, and one of those is through the bringing of our tithes and our offerings into the Lord's house. And so let me invite our ushers to come forward, and as they do, it, it doesn't matter how you give, and don't ever give because a pastor at any church you're ever at or a part of asks you to. Give, like if, if Jesus has done what he's done that we read about today, give in response to that. That's, that's between you and him but give in response to that. There's a number of ways you can give. You see them on the screen. Let me give you an example. Thank you for giving. This week, we're sending college students to one of our church planning partners in Chicago. Your giving is helping offset the cost of airfare, transportation, housing while we're up there to work with one of our ministry partners. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's how your giving is making a tangible difference. Let's pray together, and I wanna to share with you something. God, thank you so much for your goodness. Keep showing us ways where we can part with our worldly treasures so that we can meet needs and introduce people to Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, let me invite Michael Milligan to join me on the platform. And I ask Michael and Haley, his fiance, Haley Bills, to join me here. Some of y'all know Michael. Michael is our tech director here at the church, and he has been in this role for over five years. What you may not know, you probably don't know Michael if you've not seen him up front, and thank you for letting me call you up here. This is not his thing. He does not want to be called up in front of the church. He serves behind the scenes. He's been doing it for a long time, and it is a quarter-time role. In addition, these last half decade of years to his 40-hour-a-week full-time job. So he's going over and above to minister and serve us, and so recently, he and Haley got engaged last year, and they are getting excited about the future. And as they think about that, you may not know that on a Sunday, Michael doesn't really worship. I mean, he's working, and he's serving, and he fills up his soul elsewhere. But, like, he's excited about the future they have for them to worship together and to travel to go see their families together. And so last fall, he started kind of articulating to me what he thought was his future. And a couple months ago, he said, I, I think it's time for me and Haley to take a step back from leading in this role. So one of the things that I want you to know is I wanted to publicly thank him for his Christ-like attitude and service in front of his church. This man, yeah. Mm. 
Yeah. Uh, one of my core values in life is it's not, what we, it's not just what we say, it's how we say it. I don't want to just have great services on Sunday. We're a family. And so shepherding and coaching and leading is important to all of us. This man not only does the work to the glory of God, but the way he does it is so shepherdly and so kind and compassionate. Um, I don't think you know this, but somebody who has the opportunity to travel around to all eight of our campuses said, in my opinion, this man's the best tech director of all of them. So thank you. Thank you. Haley, we are thrilled for you guys. And if he, if he weren't there and I blotted him out, which I could do easily, okay? Like, <laughs> you are a leader and you are a godly woman of character and you love the local church. And so we're thrilled for what God's doing in your life. But we believe that you are better together this year and this fall in ministry than you are as individuals. We're thrilled for y'all. We're thrilled for your families. And... Um, we just wanted to bless you by telling you that and thank you. Michael, I'm forever indebted, and your fingerprints will always be on this ministry in this church. So we're excited about that. So here's what I thought we would do. Uh, let me invite them to stand right down here. And I see our deacons that are standing in the back. Let me invite you men to come on forward. And if you know them, you're welcome to come up here. I told you this before. Um, when you feel somebody's hand on your shoulder, it reminds you that you're human. You're created for a relationship. It reminds you that other people want God's best for you. So we're certainly going to do that. And um, I mean, gosh, what a godly man. Mm. Hope you guys will be okay. We'll just skip the doxology today, okay? Let's let this be our prayer. Let me ask you to stand. Let me ask you to stand as an affirmation of God's work in this man and your desire to want God's best for him and Haley in the future. They're awesome. Let's pray together. God, thank you for our brother. Thank you for the way that he loves you. Thank you for the way that he has poured into this church and this congregation. There's been so many times he's been up here in the evening or on the weekends because he has another job and it's full time and he has just given and given and given. And he has never grumbled or complained or asked for anything. It reminds me of the way Jesus lived. Thank you. Thank you for him. Thank you for Haley. Thank you for their marriage that's coming up later this year. We pray your best. We're coming to the best advocate that ever has been to ask as advocates for them, for your father's best, for their marriage, for future. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would raise up men and women who want to serve in the local church in sound and in lighting and the images on the screen that help us all worship because of this man's ministry. Do that for the glory of your Father and for the joy of your church and for Haley and Michael. We love them. We are so grateful for them. Bless them in the future. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a great Sunday, and we hope to see you back next weekend.